Well, good evening, Maranatha Baptist Church. Uh, I'm so tempted to say it's good to see you. Unfortunately, I can't see any of your faces, but hopefully you can see mine. Um, just a reminder before we get started in our Bible study in the book of Jonah tonight, that this will be available not only here in this group as a video to go back and watch, but we'll upload it to YouTube as well. That means that people outside of this private uh, Maranatha Facebook group will be able to see it. So hopefully that will be up, uploaded either later this evening, more likely than not, just the time it takes, it'll be uploaded sometime tomorrow. I will post that link when it is available for you to be able to share or just go back and watch yourself. Uh, but tonight we are starting our fall semester of Bible study uh, in the book of Jonah. And this has become one of my favorite books of the Old Testament. I think it's an incredibly timely book in our day and age, and I trust that you'll be excited um, to study it with me. So it'll be going from now until I think the second week in November. That's about nine weeks total. So I'm looking forward to studying this book with you. In my office right now, my home office where I am, uh, my uh, wife's cat has decided to join me. She insisted on being here. So um, if we have any misbehaving, know that it's probably due to the cat. I'm going to go ahead and blame it on her. And, uh, but I, I figured that'd be appropriate because in the book of Jonah, um, there are animals that are mentioned and play a significant role in the story several times. And the Lord seems to have mercy even on the cattle. So I figure if the Lord can have mercy on the cattle, I can have mercy on my wife's house cat. Uh, but without further ado, we're going to spend our time tonight studying the book of Jonah, the first three verses. I'll read the first three verses. We'll have a brief word of prayer, and then we'll dig into the book together. So listen carefully, for this is God's word to us as a church. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Amen, and thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, as we study your word tonight, help us to see not just Jonah's story, but our own story not just Jonah's life, but our own life. Help us to see and help us to understand what you would have for us to, according to your word. For it's in Jesus' name that we ask and pray these things. Amen. Well, tonight, as I've already mentioned several times, we're beginning our journey through the book of Jonah. Now, it's a book that I'm certain that almost everybody that's joining us for our Bible study is somewhat familiar with. In fact, if I had to make a bet I bet that most of us could fill out the major plot points of the story of Jonah with no problem. Um, it's a book that's just very familiar, not only to us, but even people that aren't churchgoers seem to know a little bit about the story of Jonah. Um, so the question you might be asking is, well, since everybody knows Jonah, why aren't we studying something like, I don't know, Nahum or Habakkuk or Haggai or one of those prophets that we know are in the Bible but really don't know anything about. Well, while it's true that we do have a passing um, familiarity with Jonah, I think that there's probably a lot about the story that we overlook or maybe we miss some of the subtle nuances of it. So I tend to think, to be honest, that the story of Jonah has throughout church history been largely misunderstood um, by all kinds of people. In fact, I think of something like, uh, uh, you probably have heard of Veggie Tales, uh, that um, evangelical cartoon for children. They do Old Testament stories, and one of their famous ones is about Jonah. But they cover the story of Jonah only so far. They do about the first three chapters, and then they truncate off the fourth chapter altogether. But it's really in the fourth chapter that we understand sort of the scandalous nature of the book. And so if we don't um, get to that chapter, which many stories and many tellings of Jonah don't go that far, we don't really understand what God is trying to do. And so I think, very unfortunately, and pardon the pun here, but the story of Jonah has been watered down for Christians throughout the ages. So all of us know 
a little bit about it, though. We know that it's a book about a prophet who is on the run from God. God tells him to do something, and he flees in the opposite direction. And then eventually, he gets found out by God. He's in the middle of the ocean, and he gets tossed overboard. And what's most memorable for people is that he's eaten by a giant fish. And he stays there for three days before being vomited up back onto the land. But really, that's just scratching the surface of what's happening in the story of Jonah. And this is more than just a story to entertain children, although it is that too. One of my professors in seminary would talk about the book of Jonah and imagining um, a father at night sitting around a campfire with his two boys and, and telling the story of Jonah and the little boys rolling on the ground with laughter. It is supposed to be a silly story that even children can understand part of it. But really, the deeper meaning, I think, is it's a story that warns believing adults away from their temptation to be treacherous to God, to be treacherous to his mercy. So tonight, we're only going to tackle the first three verses, very short verses, because I think it's crucial for us to get a background of Jonah as a character and kind of a background on the book, a background on the genre of the book. So it'll help us really understand the complexity, larger um, themes at work in the story of Jonah. So first thing I want to draw your attention to is that Jonah is an incredibly complex and actually very brilliantly designed piece of literature while still being very simple in its message. And although it's a prophetic work, it's different from every other prophetic book that we find in the Old Testament, mostly in the fact that it doesn't seem to have a lot of prophecy or prophetic language, but it does have a story. So that is the major difference between Jonah and some of his peers. But it does combine all different types of genres of literature into just four chapters. So for most of us, that's maybe two or three pages of our Bible. And what's interesting is you can tell that this is a story that's not just haphazardly told, but been crafted really well because chapters one and three are sort of mirror images of one another. And simi or, or, um, similarly, rather, chapters two and four are also kind of mirrors of one another. But we'll get to that a different night. But I want to get back to the genres, the, the types of literature that you can find just in the book of Jonah. Well, obviously, right off the bat, the book of Jonah is a theological work meaning it's a work to help us understand something about God's character. But in addition to that, it's also a historical work. It helps us to understand a little bit something more about life in ancient Israel and life in ancient Assyria. It's a sociological book. It, it helps us to understand the cultures and the complicated relationships between the Assyrians, or in their capital city of Nineveh, the Ninevites that we'll meet in a few chapters, um, who were a evil and corrupt society. It helps us to understand them, but it also helps us to understand uh, northern Israel as well, who were in many ways just as guilty of social and political and military sins just like the Assyrians were. But most surprisingly of all, at least most surprisingly to me, I think the book of Jonah is also a satirical work, meaning it's a work of satire. In other words, it's supposed to be humorous. It's supposed to strike us as funny and strange and over the top. And all of that is supposed to be kind of with a little edge to it. It's supposed to make us laugh, but also make us think. It's supposed to be kind of a commentary of, uh, of life in this ancient day. Now, I'm sure most of us, by way of comparison, have watched something of satire, read something of satire. And probably the most popular example of satire uh, in American culture would be the TV show that maybe some of you have watched. I imagine some of you have enjoyed it throughout the years, Saturday Night Live. Saturday Night Live, of course, is this ske sketch comedy show that's been airing on NBC for about 40 plus years now. And you know how it goes. It features some actors and some hosts that are usually celebrities of some type and, and comedians, and they come together and they perform skits, many of which are lampooning some aspect of pop culture. But sometimes the most memorable ones are the ones that are poking fun at our current political situation. Now, the way satire works historically, satire works when it takes real people, real ideas, real events, 
for instance, politicians and celebrities, and it places them in the middle of extreme and unnatural stories that end up highlighting their character flaws. So it's not simply just about teasing people. It's not simply about making um, jokes or punching down at people, but it's, it's really intended to tease um, not only the people that it's showing, but it's meaning also to tease a little bit the people who are reading it. So it's a way to point out not only the hypocritical things that the people in the sketches do, but the hypocritical things that the people who are watching it do as well. And so it's doing this all while trying to make people laugh. So that's what satire is. And I think that's what the, the book of Jonah, what the story of Jonah is for us. It's a book of satire, not just about Jonah and Israel and Assyria and the Ninevites. It's a satire about us as human beings. It's not just a story about a disobedient prophet named Jonah who is, by the way, very mean-spirited, if not downright hateful, man. It's not just about Jonah, it's also about the hard-heartedness of God's people. Whether it's the ancient Jewish followers of Yahweh, or it's us modern-day Christians who foolishly think that with all of our nasty sins that we deserve mercy, while our enemies... Uh, who with all their equally nasty sins don't deserve mercy. It's taking a shot at people just like us. So the story of Jonah reveals something. It reveals how we are all equally susceptible to and guilty of opposing God, opposing his word, and even opposing his mercy to sinners like us. We could be stand-ins for Jonah in many ways. So all throughout this book, we are going to see a comically awful prophet named Jonah. He is terrible. He's really bad at his job. Most of the prophets of his day would be jealous of the kind of responses he gets, but he just seems to be just all uh, eaten up with bitterness on the inside. And so we'll see how bad he is, but we'll also see surprising things like pagan sailors or pagan warriors that end up repenting of their sin. And we're going to watch all sorts of wacky events unfold. First of all, like Jonah getting eaten by an enormous fish and then vomited up three days later. Or we'll see how a tiny little worm eats this humongous gourd plant that grows over Jonah and protects him from the heat. And most strangely of all, we'll see that even the cattle, even the cows and the sheep and the goats repent of their sins in the story of Jonah. All these moments are meant to strike us as funny and strange because they're making a larger and surprising point about God and how he loves his creation so desperately, so wonderfully, and even in its worst fallenness, even at its lowest point, the Lord loves his creation and seeks to redeem it. So you do well as you read the story of Jonah to Keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes peeled for big, exaggerated language. Look at specifically the weird speeches that are given. Try to find the irony in them. And look for the dark sense of humor all throughout the book because it's there and it's intentional for us. All these things are meant to shock us. They're meant to make us laugh. But ultimately, it's meant to do that to get us to reflect not only about ourselves, but really about the heart of God for his sinful world. And these, are, these things are supposed to get us to see also how stupid, we might say, how stupid it is to think that we can run from the presence and the love of God and how pointless it is to ignore his word and his wisdom and even how capable any of us and every single one of us are of making the mistakes that Jonah makes any single day of our lives. But ultimately, here's the good news. Ultimately, the story is meant to point us forward past a cynical Jonah, past the evil Ninevites, and even past our own sinful selves. And it's a story that is meant to point us ultimately and directly to Jesus. Because when we come to the New Testament, we'll see that Jesus actually reinterprets the sign of Jonah for himself. He takes the, the symbol of one man's disobedience and of God's justice and reinterprets and reappropriates it 
in and of himself so that he is the one, not unlike Jonah, that is swallowed up alive by the justice of God. But unlike Jonah, Jesus being swallowed up by the watery depths means that he will die, that he um, will go to his grave in order to grant us forgiveness and a transformed and a resurrected life. So these are some things to keep in mind as we go through the story of Jonah together. So let's go ahead and begin our strange and surprising and, and satirical story of Jonah together. Let's begin by rereading the first verse to reorient ourselves here. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now there's a few things that we should notice right off the bat. So first, this book looks very similar to other Old Testament prophetic books. It starts with this phrase, with the word of the Lord coming to a person. That is an exact phrase. Now the word of the Lord came to so-and-so. We see that phrase used in Hosea and Joel and Micah. These are all books that are prophetic wisdom books that launch right into these prophetic visions from the Lord. But in Jonah, unlike these other books, it doesn't start with a prophecy, with a vision. It starts instead simply with a story. Now, already for that reason, Jonah is a strange book. And if you were an ancient reader of these Old Testament books and you were reading them together and you get to Jonah, you'd notice that something is a little strange or different here. You'd be surprised by this. So we see that right off the bat, Jonah is a strange book. But second, and the most important thing in Jonah, or any of these books of prophecy, really, is not really the prophets. It's not really the people they're supposed to be prophesying to, or even the evil nations they're supposed to be prophesying against. But ultimately, the thing that we're supposed to notice, that it's the word of the Lord that ultimately will stoop down low to reveal his infinite goodness and truth and beauty, even to lowly sinners. The word of the Lord comes to lowly sinners like Jonah, lowly sinners like you and I. Because the most, in the most important person, rather, in the book of Jonah is not Jonah. It's the Lord. It's the God who comes down to speak with and be merciful to hateful men like Jonah, with violent people like the Ninevites, and ultimately with sinners like us who read it. So the word of the Lord came down. But who did it come down to? Well, it came down to Jonah, the son of Amittai. So who exactly is Jonah? What's his background story? Well, we actually don't really know that much about Jonah from the scriptures. He obviously appears all throughout this book, but he's mentioned one other place in scripture, and it's very brief. But we get a lot of um, inference from his story from 2 Kings 14. He's only in a few verses there. But let me read a couple of those verses for us. So starting in verse 23 of 2 Kings 14, we read this. In the 15th year of Amazai, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned for 41 years. Verse 24. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. And so we get a story of Jeroboam as a wicked king in northern Israel ruling in Samaria. But where does Jonah figure into this? Well, let's look at this next verse. Who is his right-hand man in all this? Next verse tells us, And he spoke by his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from gath Hefer. So see, unlike the faithful prophets like Amos and Hosea that were alive during the time of Jeroboam and criticized his evil administration and its violence and his injustice, Jonah was on the payroll of this wicked king in northern Israel. So Jonah was supporting, actually, Jeroboam's unethical military actions, for instance, that really looked more like the tactics of the Assyrians than, than it would look like those of a faithful and just Israelite king. Pastor Tim Keller suggests that 
the Jewish people who would have first read Jonah's story would have remembered how that Jonah was a highly partisan prophet. Jonah was not a perceived by the people of Israel, at least the faithful ones, as a good person, because Jonah was more inclined to agree with a wicked king than he was to listen to the God for whom he was supposed to be a prophet. And he was more likely to want to be a strict nationalist than he was to be faithful to God's explicit commands to his people to be a light, not only to Israel, but to all nations. And yet, rather ironically, we read, Jonah's name means dove. And his father's name, his surname, is Amittai, or Amittai, which means truth. So here's a man who's named, uh, and, and is not only named, but given the commission, given the, the task as a prophet, to, to be and bring God's peace and truth into the world. But we see that is an ironic name for Jonah because he is more interested in serving Jeroboam and northern Israel's greed and vengeance than he is about bringing God's peace and truth to anybody. But nevertheless, God is good. God is gracious to sinners like us and to sinners like Jonah because he stoops low to speak kindly to a prophet that has already proven himself to be corrupt. And so he speaks to Jonah. And what does he say to Jonah? We read that in verse 2. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now God calls Jonah to go to the capital of the Assyrian Empire, namely the city of Nineveh. God calls it a great city because it is prominent. It's important in the grand scheme of history in that day and age, but he also calls it uh, an evil city, which underlines that not only is it prominent, not only is it an important city, quote unquote, but it's deeply, deeply wicked. So wicked, in, in fact, that the Lord has heard the cries of the people that have been oppressed by this terrible Assyrian empire, and so he has commissioned Jonah to call out against it and judgment. But we know from the next verse, and we know just from Sunday school classes since we were children, that Jonah does the exact opposite of God's commission here. Instead of going up to Nineveh, we read, he descends down away from Nineveh. He goes down to Joppa, for instance. He goes down into the heart of a ship, and worst of all, he goes down, spiraling away from the presence of the Lord. So the question we might want to know at this point is why? Why would he do that? Why would he disobey God? Well, in the days of Jonah, the Assyrian Empire, with Nineveh as its capital, was one of the most important and powerful and really terrifying people group in all of the known world. Not only were they wealthy and sophisticated, but they were unimaginably, unspeakably cruel. So, for instance, one of their emperors, Shalmaneser III, commissioned public art, not of, you know, nice things, not of horses, or not public art of the, the, the city's greatest artist or anything like that, but he depicted, or he commissioned public art, art depicting torture, or dismemberment, or decapitations, or impaling. So the Assyrian soldiers were so brutal, they were known all throughout the ancient world for cutting off their victims' limbs and playing with them as the victims bled to death. They would force families to carry around the decapitated heads of their loved ones on, on spikes, and they would even flay and burn their victims alive before displaying their skin like a flag on the conquered city walls. Most shockingly of all, they would gleefully kill children and babies in front of their families laughing while they did it. They were truly a nation of terrorists, deeply awful people. They were like the Nazis of the ancient world, perhaps even worse. And God has called Jonah to go preach to them, to denounce them in their sin. And although northern Israel would not fall to Assyria for some years after Jonah's time, it's easy to understand why Jonah's complete aversion 
uh, or he had a complete aversion to these evil, evil, evil people. It'd be like asking a, a Jewish man, an Ashkenazi Jewish man, who had family dying in German concentration camps to go to Berlin and preach judgment against the Nazis in the early 1940s. It seems like absolutely foolish. And so our story so far is this. We have an evil prophet from an evil administration and an evil nation called to preach judgment against another evil people group. So he should be excited. I mean, Jonas seems like he's kind of a, a bloodthirsty guy if he's on Jeroboam's payroll. He should be excited that he gets to go and condemn Nineveh and all of Assyria, but he's not. In fact, he runs away. But this brings us to our last verse for tonight. Verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah's response to the Lord's call is to run away. Jonah's response to the Lord's call is to flee from the Lord's presence altogether. Jonah was called to arise, to get up and go up to Nineveh. So we see that language of upward ascending. And he was supposed to go east to Nineveh from where he was. And Jonah does, we see in the text, he does arise, but he arises so he can descend, so he can flee the opposite direction of Nineveh, to go all the way to Tarshish. Now, scholars have debated about this for some years, but it's generally agreed upon that Tarshish is probably an ancient name for Spain, which is um, the, the westernmost part of the known world at the time. So in other words, Jonah is literally wanting to go to the end of the earth as far away from God's call and his presence and um, from the, his task of prophecy as far geographically possible as he could. And so not only did he run from God's presence, the text tells us that he descended. He didn't rise up, he descended down, but he did it twice. First, he descended down to the port city of Joppa on the, on the coast of the Mediterranean. And then we see he descends down again into the dark bowels of the ship. And this, I think, is very symbolic of what sin does to us. When we hear the voice of God, we tend to try to slink away from it, to go deeper into our darkness, to try to hide away from it. We're kind of like Adam and Eve in that sense. When we try to hide under trees and, and bushes and, and we try to hide in the darkness of our own life's ship to get away from the light of the Lord, to get away from his presence. So the Old Testament scholar James Lindbergh notes that the Hebrew term for flee here is actually one that denotes not just simply running away from something, but it denotes fleeing a relationship. So we see this used elsewhere in the Old Testament, how Hagar, for instance, flees from her mistress, Sarah, or Jacob, who flees from his uncle Laban. So Jonah is fleeing from his relationship with God. But we know that that is not how the story ends, of course. Jonah tries to flee away from the presence of God, and he discovers fleeing away from God means that he's going to flee right back into his presence on the other side. Because our God, unlike the God of the Assyrians, unlike our modern idols today, our God is everywhere. It's impossible for Jonah to escape God or to escape his presence. But it's also impossible for him to escape God's task for him. So Jonah may have left his comfy position as Jeroboam's yes man, and he may have even lost a small fortune traveling to the end of the world, and ultimately he's, he gets close to losing his life in this story. But nevertheless, God makes sure that he endures so that he can do his task of going to Nineveh to preach. And finally, not only is it impossible to escape from God's presence, impossible to escape from God's calling, 
But mercifully, thankfully, it's impossible to escape from God's love. Jonah should have been champing at the bit to go and condemn Nineveh for their years of brutality to the people all over the uh, Middle Eastern world. He should have been so excited to denounce their animalistic violence. But as we'll soon find out later in the story, he didn't want to go to preach to them, not because he thought that ultimately they would be judged and that they would be um, uh, destroyed or wiped out by God. He didn't want to go preach to them because he was afraid they might in fact repent. And he knew God's character well enough, even if he didn't serve him well, he knew the character of Yahweh enough to know that if a sinner repents and calls on the name of the Lord, that God is merciful to save that sinner. And that made Jonah deeply, deeply angry that God would even possibly save his enemies. Here's the dark irony, though, of Jonah's life. It's easy to look at him and be judgmental of Jonah. He's a prophet that wants to be unsuccessful. He wants to side with people who are evil in God's sight. And yet, when God called out to Jonah with his word, and that word makes people alive, to go and preach both sin and grace so that Nineveh might repent of their evil and find forgiveness. Although that is the task, that is the point of the story of Jonah, Jonah ran far away from that wonderful life. But at the end of the day, friends, we'd be fooling ourselves to think that the story of Jonah is just about Jonah, the wicked prophet. It's just about his wicked northern Israel kingdom. It's just about his wicked military enemies in the Ninevites. Because at the end of the day, the story of Jonah is not just about their wickedness. It's about the wickedness of our own hearts. Because in the darkly comic figure of Jonah, although he is funny and we do laugh at him and scoff at him, we also kind of see our own ugly reflection. The, the, the reflection of our own hardened hearts and how easy it is for us to ingratiate ourselves to powerful people that can do evil things but make us rich and successful and how tempting it is for us to ignore the spiritual needs of even our enemies. Instead of obeying God's call to do justice and love mercy, it's easy to be like Jonah and simply love our own station in life. And so the book of Jonah satirizes not only this moment in time, but it satirizes our very lives and existence as people that are tempted, even though we say we worship God, to do everything in our power to try to escape the wonderful things he would have us do because it means the forgiveness of our enemies. And yet, as the book begins, so does it end with the holy and life-giving and merciful word of God. And that word we know ultimately is the Lord Jesus, the word of God that is made flesh in him, who like Jonah came to live amongst sinners, but unlike Jonah and unlike us, does so willingly. The story of Jesus is greater than the story of Jonah because Jesus, who was eternally God, put on human flesh to live life willingly for people that would end up hating him. But it didn't just stop there. Jesus didn't like Jonah just preach and, and, and see miraculous things in his day and age, but Jesus took all the sins of those who would believe on him from past, present, or future and put those sins on his shoulders and went to a cross, even for his enemies, so that as he died, he might rise on the third day, and we who had been filled with hate and disobedience would one day live again in his mercy and his love. This is the beginning of the story of Jonah. We have a long ways to go, and I'm excited to see not only myself in the story and to see my temptations to be like Jonah and hate the things that God actually loves, but I'm excited to see, above all, Jesus 
to see the God who is so merciful and gracious to the worst of the worst in humanity and loves them and even gives himself up for them. I hope you're looking forward to that too. But let's close now with a time of prayer. Father, help us to see in this humorous scripture our own serious state as sinners. And help us as we're tempted to live like Jonah with hate in our hearts towards one another to instead trust and obey you. Forgive us, Lord, when we flee, and we flee often from your presence and your tasks and your love. And Lord, we praise you that Jesus succeeds exactly where Jonah and we and the whole world fails. So make us alive together again in Jesus, your word made flesh for us. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you again next time.